Thank you for coming here. I'm excited to talk to you about Ruby Lambdas. Um, first, I want to apologize in advance for my very thick American accent. I hope you'll still be able to understand me. Um, and uh, I do know that I can speak quickly and sometimes not so clearly, so feel free to stop me. Um, anyway, uh, who here has worked with Ruby before at all? Okay. And um, have you worked with Ruby? Like, anybody worked with it quite a bit? Okay. Anybody explored lambdas with Ruby at all? Okay, good. Um, and for you others, are you mainly involved in object-oriented development? Java, C sharp, that kind of language? Okay, good. So we have kind of a almost equal mix, I guess. Um, First, I want to say I am not an expert on functional programming. I've uh, been in study groups for Erlang and Clojure and really enjoyed it. And I've been exploring functional techniques in Ruby, but I'm, I'm not a guru, and so uh, uh, please keep that in mind. A lambda is a free-floating function. It doesn't belong to a class or an object. It's not even associated with one. Neil Ford says, uh, explains, functions in a functional language are considered first class, meaning that functions can appear anywhere that any other language construct, such as variables, can appear. And we'll see throughout the presentation how lambdas are really very uh, flexible. You can put them anywhere, unlike methods, which have to be in certain places. And by enabling functions as return values, and I would say also parameters and variables, uh, you can create the opportunity to build highly dynamic, adaptable systems. We saw a lot of this in the last um, presentation about Java. As for me, I haven't, uh, as they say, drunk the functional Kool-Aid completely yet. Um, I'm very excited about it, but I still have one of my feet in the object-oriented world. And um, so I look at functional programming as a complement to object-oriented programming and feel that uh, there's a place for both of them. This is directed to the Rubyists. Do you remember when you encountered code blocks for the first time? And that they were very confusing at first. I know they were for me. The syntax kind of confused me. It wasn't really clear from the syntax what was happening when. Uh, it was later that it, it, I realized that this was just a, a block of code that was being passed to the method, and the method could do whatever it wanted with it. But you persevered and you mastered them. Was it worth the effort? Probably so. Um, in fact, uh, Ruby without code blocks would be a, a very different language. Well, coming from code blocks, lambdas are the next step in that progression. Code blocks are kind of code literals, but lambdas are objects that contain code, and there's really a lot of similarity between them. So whereas most Rubyists avoid lambdas thinking that there's some functional corner of the universe that doesn't apply to me, they're really already in that functional universe using code blocks. Many Rubyists will complain, but it's not idiomatic Ruby to use lambdas because nobody understands what lambdas are. If Rubyists don't already know what it is, you will confuse them. They'll have to learn something new, something else new. This will discourage people from entering the, the Ruby world. But I believe that the benefits of using lambdas are so compelling that it's worth deviating from that idiomatic Ruby or even changing it. Why should the Rubyists care about lambdas? Lambdas can help us simplify our code, make it more extensible, and we can become more productive and therefore have more fun doing what we're doing. We heard a little bit about this before. Unnecessary complexity is our enemy. As software developers, we, we do or should be doing our best to eliminate unnecessary complexity. We strive to maximize the ratio of functionality over complexity. If we absolutely need some complexity to get some functionality, then we can live with that. But if it's just there because we haven't taken the opportunity to improve our code, that's not so great. So we're always trying to maximize this ratio so that our code can be highly functional and yet maintainable and extensible and comprehensible to the reader. 
Local variables have been around for a long time, and uh, I'm going to be a little bit sort of sarcastic here when I, when I say this. Uh, when we define variables in Ruby, we define them all as instance or class variables, right? Limiting their scope by declaring them local has no value to us. Does that make sense? No. Of course, we want variables to be local because that limits their scope and makes them, uh, it makes the inter it increases the number of possible interactions in the code, which makes it simpler, which is good. And yet, that's exactly what we do in languages like Ruby and until recently Java uh, with instance methods. Any piece of functionality except for code blocks is in a method, and a method can only be in a class. It can only be an instance method or a class method defined at this class level. So every time you want to extract functionality into a method, you're adding to this list of instance methods. And when the reader comes and looks and reads your class, he or she will see a, a long list of methods and there'll be a lot there and it'll be confusing. One measure of complexity is the number of possible paths of interaction. So let's say each of these circles is an instance method uh, and the possible interactions are indicated by the lines between them and the, the method call can go in either direction. So for each line, we multiply by two to get the number of possible interactions. Also, we can multiply n times the quantity n minus one. And with five instance methods, we get 20 possible interactions. With just five, that's a lot. Wouldn't it be nice if we could make method-like things local to a method? And in practice, I find at least, I, I don't know about you, but in my experience, it's very often that a method is called by only one other method. So it's kind of like the implementation detail for a method. And so why not make them local methods? Okay. If we can do that, and, and here we show what that might look like. We have two lambdas uh, that we remove two methods and make them two lambdas inside one of the methods. We now have decreased our count of instance methods from five to three and have decreased the complexity from 20 to six. That's over three times. That's a lot. So this is what it might look like. Let's say I had these lambdas, uh, fetch type one data, fetch type two data, doing two different fetches of information over a network, and then something to integrate the data. And then I can tie them all together at the bottom here. These are implementation details for this outer method. This could be the public method and this just the internal implementation details. So somebody reading the class wouldn't need to see this these as instance methods. So for all you OO developers, is there anything about the structure that looks familiar? Anybody? Does it look like something you're familiar with? With the indentation and the the subdivisions of functionality, class. <laughs> it's kind of like a class, right? So whereas before we have this here as a single method and these lambdas within the method, instead we can have a class and those lambdas become instance methods of that class. And that's really what object-oriented development and design is all about. It's, it's making small classes that do one thing well. And because they started out writing this, this big method with lambdas and, and subdividing the functionality into units of like related uh, behavior, it was a very trivial matter to convert that to a class. When we encourage ourselves to convert code to classes, we, we wind up with better quality code. How many times have you seen really large, humongous classes that are doing way too much for one class but to refactor that would just be so difficult that you never do it because you wouldn't have time. Right? If you start out at the beginning by using nested lambdas, then you already have that class structure. Um, so in, in this case, uh, I might decide, well, you know what, this is getting really complicated. This really should be a class. I'm not anti-class or anything. Sometimes it should be a class. So if you start out with this lambda design, it's easy to make it a class. And in this class, this run method might be the only public method. These could all be private. 
Feel free to interrupt with questions or comments. Another nice thing about using lambdas is that once you have packaged your code in a lambda, you can pass it around and do things with it that, that are easier than if it were just one of the longest block of code. As an example, at one point I realized I'm doing these network accesses. Why am I doing them in sequence when I can be doing them in parallel? And most of my time is just waiting anyway, right? So since these are already lambdas, it became trivial to put this structure around it um, to, to do that in two threads. One of the things that's been mentioned earlier today and that I believe really strongly is that you should, a given chunk of code should have one theme. Kind of. Different things should be in different parts of the code. Here, I have the mechanism for running two threads and waiting for them to finish. The only thing I have that says anything about what's actually being run in those threads is the minimum possible thing I could have, which is the name of a lambda, right? There is no implementation detail here. So theoretically, if this became a pattern that I was using really often, I could extract it out into some method somewhere in some utility thing and, and refactor even more. So let's step back a little bit and look at the syntax for defining lambdas in Ruby. Uh, Ruby moved from version 1.8 to 1.9 several years ago, and it was a pretty big change in the language, and some new syntax was added. Before 1.9, this was the way, the only way you could define a lambda. You used the lambda. It looks like a keyword, but I believe it's actually a method on the kernel class. In any case, you would say lambda and then curly braces or do end. And any code would be inside the curly braces or the do end. And for those not familiar with Ruby, these are pretty synonymous, the curly braces and the do end. Idiomatically, if it's going to be only, only one line, we use the curly braces. And if it's going to be multiple lines, we use do end. Starting in 1.9, we have what's called the stabby lambda syntax, which is this arrow here. And I like this better because it's kind of like a picture rather than a word, and so it stands out to me as, as a lambda. And if we have parameters in the lambda, then before 1.9, we would have to define them like this. And this is exactly the way it's done in the code block. But starting with 1.9, we get to do it this way. And this is exactly the way you would do it in a function, a method. Boring details, right? Uh, one of the first things I did with uh, lambdas when I started experimenting with them was use them in unit tests. There are many times when you might have a method that you've designed to raise an exception if it gets a bad input or, or something bad happens. You might want to test that that really does happen when it's supposed to. And our spec has this special method here that you can use, raise error. You can pass a lambda in. It won't get executed until it's safely inside the RSpec framework. And RSpec will look to see if a result, an error was raised, and um, either pass or fail the test accordingly. Um, the simplest thing I could think of would be to, you know, to divide one by zero to generate an error. Lambdas are also assignable. We can assign them to variables. So here we have a, a lambda that takes a name as a parameter and returns a string containing that name. And again, for those not familiar with Ruby, when you have a double-quoted string, this uh, pound curly braces will enclose an expression that will be evaluated, and then that pound curly brace text string will be replaced with the result of that evaluation. It's called interpolation. It's a fancy word for substitution. And then we can call it in several ways. Um, in all versions of Ruby, we can call it with the call method and the square brackets. And starting in 1.9, we have the dot paren notation, which is the one I prefer because it's more compact. The square brackets, um, I, I really don't like using that because Square brackets have a special meaning to me, and I think to most people, it's the way we get a value out of a bigger thing, such as a hash or an array. And so I hardly ever use it, but I'll show one case where I do uh, a little later. Lambdas are closures, which means they carry with them the 
context in which they were defined. And by context, I mean basically the, the local variables. So here we have statement n equals 15. And we have a lambda. Um, puts just as like a print, print line in Java. Uh, we output that value. So we define the lambda here, and then the dot paren calls it right there. And uh, the result we get would be 15, because it can see this n outside of itself. This is, this can be a good thing, but this can also be a bad thing. You may not intend to access that variable that's in the outer scope. For example, what if you have a, a lambda that uses an intermediate variable, what it thinks is a local variable, but because it has already been defined in the scope, instead it's modifying that thing that was already created outside the scope. In this case, we have n equals 15, and then we run this lambda where we assign the string to n, and when we output n, we get the string. I just overwrote n because we've overwritten it there. There's another thing that you can do with lambdas that can be risky, can be powerful, but also risky, which is kind of like the theme of Ruby, I guess, um, is the lambda, you can get the binding of a lambda by calling its binding method. The binding contains the local variable. And binding has a method on it called eval, where you can give it an arbitrary string of Ruby code, and that string will be evaluated in the context of that binding. So since name is in the binding of this lambda, we can, we can run this, and we're going to overwrite name with another name, and then this will print out here. Now this doesn't seem too harmful, right? But if you have several lambdas that you've defined in the same binding, and one of them changes a value in the, the binding that's shared by the others, that could be kind of dangerous. So um, Ruby may not be the best functional language to use for functional programming, um, but just be informed and, and um, choose what you think is best. I love Ruby because I think it's a, an awesome general purpose programming language and to have the functional aspects added to it is really, uh, it's really wonderful. We can get around that problem by specifying in the parameter list, this isn't really a parameter, but this is where the parameters would go if there were some. We can specify that this is a lambda local by having a semicolon and then the name of the variable that we want to be considered local. If there were other parameters, they would be here before the semicolon. So here we're saying, hey, if you see n in this lambda, don't use an n from outside, create a new local. And we can see by this code that that works um, because when we output n, it's still 15, even though we have computed both zero. Does that make sense? I mentioned that there was there were a few cases where the square bracket notation might make sense, and here is one of them. I have been working with um, a data set that was several levels deep in hashes and arrays, and accessing anything with square brackets is a real pain when you have to use five of them. And so I thought, well, let me see if there's a better way. And, and a colleague started this, and I kind of carried the ball a little further and wrote something like this, where you could separate the levels with a period or any arbitrary character, and it would do the navigation, the descending for you. So um, here's a collection. This is an array of three elements. The first is a string, the second is a hash, the third is another array. And um, this array has three things in it. And so if we access one dot color, one is this hash, color is this, and we get yellow. Two dot two, Two is this array, and the second two is the last element of this inner array, and you get 75. So in this case, accessor is a lambda, and normally I wouldn't use these square brackets, but because it's doing something that you would expect something with square brackets to do, I think it's a good idea to use them in this case. In Ruby, we have, like in Java, we have public, private, protected methods. Uh, the meaning is a little bit different, but almost the same. But you can get around that privacy because with any class or any object, you can call its send method and give it the name of a function, and it will call that function even if it's private. 
If you really want something to be private, you can make it a lambda local to that method. And then it only lives for the lifetime of the method call. So there's no way you can reach in and, and find it and get to it. I, I gave this talk in Pittsburgh a couple months ago, and uh, somebody pointed out after the conference, he did some benchmarking and found that creating and destroying a lot of lambdas actually takes time. So that's something to be careful about. If it's something that you're going to be doing 100,000 times, you might not want to create the lambda inside the method. You might want to make it, in that case, an instance method instead, or move the lambda outside and assign it to a constant of the class. In most cases, the, the, the time for creating, destroying the lambda object is very minimal compared with the work it's actually doing, and it doesn't matter. But in some cases, it might matter. I'm trying to demonstrate that I'm being objective about this. I'm not saying that you know, the Ruby is, is perfect or the functional programming in Ruby is perfect. Self-invoking anonymous functions. We actually saw this before. Um, but this is when you create a lambda and then you call it right away. Here's an example. We have this lambda that contains this code and then we call it right away. Anybody know why we might want to do that? Is it because we want to show off? We're pretentious, we know what lambdas are. Is there another reason? What about these local variables here? Well, if this isn't a lambda, these local variables will persist past the, the, the execution of this code. But because this is a lambda, these are local to the lambda and never go beyond the outside of the lambda. They don't exist anymore after the lambda is finished running. And that can be pretty handy. In fact, CopyScript uses this exact technique so that when you write a CopyScript script, you're now polluting the global JavaScript namespace with your variables. Lambdas are natural for event handlers. Here, I'm defining an event handler that when it's called with an event, will just output a string saying this event occurred and then the event that occurred. And then we can pass that to a method called add event handler. And lambdas are first class objects. We can pass them around and, and they can be held onto for later use and, um, and called. And we can make this even more concise by defining a lambda right here without even using an intermediate variable. What about when we have to customize behavior? We saw in the last episode in the Java session about uh, filtering. And um, this is a pretty common theme. In fact, you know, we talked about it last time and this time. Um, as object-oriented developers, the first thing that would come to mind would be polymorphism. We write classes that specialize the behavior. So they might look something like this. If we wanted an even filter and an odd filter, we write uh, a class with a consistent function name. That function name will be shared by all the other um, classes that we're using for this purpose. And the name here is filter. So we define these classes, and then we instantiate them, and then we can use them. It's kind of a lot of code for something really simple. If instead we use lambdas, it's much, much more concise. Here we have the even filter and the odd filter, and we use them, and it's very, very concise. And another nice thing about using lambdas, rather than classes for this, is that you can use lambdas to compose lambdas. You can have compound filters where you, you have uh, a method or, or a lambda that takes a bunch of filters and then combines them all together in one big and or 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 something like that. You can do a lot of things with lambdas more flexibly than a class method, an instance method of a class. Duplication. We're going down the same road we went in the last session again, but um, here are some methods that uh, double, quadruple, double, triple, and quadruple a number. And as you can see, there's some duplication in these methods, the times n part specifically. Um, normally, this wouldn't be really a huge red flag. It's not that much duplication, but it helps us illustrate the concept of refactoring out the duplication. So let's take a look at what we might do. We can use partial application or currying. And with partial application, we have here a, an outer lambda that creates and returns an inner lambda. We call the outer lambda with the factor, the number that we want all numbers to be multiplied by. It creates a lambda 
that when called with another number, multiplies it by that number that we were passed in when the lambda was created. So we can get a tripler by calling this with three. And then when we call it with a number, we get a tripling of the numbers. And in this way, the guts of the logic for all of these multipliers is in only one place. Similarly, because lambdas are first class objects, they can be returned by methods. So it doesn't have to be a lambda that creates a lambda, it can be a method. So this is exactly the same thing, except as a method instead of a lambda. And um, note here, we, we don't use the dot parens, we just use the regular parens and produce a regular number. Currying does the same thing, but in a different way. We start out with a function that takes all the parameters necessary for the computation, namely here, the two. And then we pre-fill one of them, one of those parameters. And this returns a lambda that we can then call with the second number to get the desired result. Curry is a method on the proc class, which returns a lambda, which when called with a method, return, uh, with a number, returns, or with a value, the pre-fill, returns another lambda. Predicates. <laughs> I should have gone before the Java talk. Uh, <laughs> predicates um, are lambdas that return a true or a false value. And uh, one of the common uses for predicates uh, is filtering. Here is an example of a function, a method, that takes a filter as an optional parameter. In Ruby, parameters can be optional. If you say parameter name equals expression, then if this parameter is not passed, then this expression will be used. This is a lambda which takes a message as its parameter and unconditionally returns true. It ignores the parameter, it always returns true. So this is the default value. It's like uh, we heard in the last session, rather than using nil and having to check for nil, instead we can just give it a default lambda and have it call that default lambda. And um, that would just let everything through. It would in effect be unfiltered. And then the way we call the filter is pretty simple, filter dot parens parameter. So this message will be added to the messages array if when we call filter with the message, filter returns true. Pretty plain English, right? You're using the word filter, it's pretty apparent what it's doing. It's not complicated. However, many Rubyists will say, why use lambdas when you could do the same thing with a code block? And you can. This is how you would do it with a code block. But I ask you, which way looks clearer to you? There's nothing in here that says anything about filtering. There's nothing here that indicates that you're passing it to the method. Because when you pass a block to a method, you don't need to specify anything here. So, and the other thing is that if a, if a method should require more than one of these, then you can't use code blocks anyway because you can only pass one code block to uh, a Ruby method. A common theme in the functional programming that, that I found is create self-contained things that do one thing well, like the Unix filter. And try to separate unrelated code out uh, into separate areas. I, I saw a really good analogy on, on Twitter. It said something like, um, fully structured code is more like um, mangled coat hangers than spaghetti. Because with spaghetti, you can pull one strand out pretty easily. But with coat hangers, it's not so easy. They're all kind of intertwined. You've got to really squeeze them apart. Am I speaking clearly enough, by the way? Okay, good, I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> okay. Um, so here's an example of, of doing that. I was writing some code that was doing some network accesses and then processing the results, and then I realized that I should really be chunking these messages into blocks. And so, from my previous years as a Java developer and before, my, my first gut reaction was to do it right there in the same code. Just add the chunking part to the same area of the code that processed the, the things that I was fetching. But then I realized, hey, wait a minute, that's not clean. What I should really be doing is separating out the um, 
the concept and the implementation of the chunking from the thing that is actually being done with the objects in the chunk. Why should they be in the same place? They shouldn't be. And when we separate them, we get all kinds of opportunities for reuse and simplification. So it went even further because I, then I thought, well, hey, the chunking thing has logic that it has to know when to get the chunk, how to dispense the objects, and keep track of things and stuff. But why does it need to know how to get the chunk? Why can't that be configurable too, right? So this is the signature of the buffered enumerable, which is uh, the name of that class um, method. It's a, a, a class method that creates an object, and um, it takes a fetcher, lambda, which is the implementation of how the record should be fetched, and optionally, a fetch notifier, lambda, as well. And this one, I realized that I needed this when I started to unit test it. I thought, how am I gonna know when it's fetching, when it's doing it the right way? So I thought, well, hey, if I put a fetch notifier in there that's configurable, then I can test it and people can use it for logging and um, maybe displaying a message to the user, or progress bar, et cetera. We've talked about lambdas as nested functions already, but here's another example of how it can clarify your code. Again, we try to separate high from low level stuff and we try to separate unrelated things from each other. The task of formatting the string really has nothing to do with what's in the string. Plus, by making it a lambda here, we eliminate the duplication so that this logic is only specified once. And we can call it three times here. Lambdas, when you have lambdas, you can't just specify them without the parentheses and expect them to be called as you can with methods because without the parentheses, it resolves to the lambda itself. Methods are not always an option. As I said before, you can't define it just anywhere. And here's an example where I defined it in an RSpec test, and then I ran it right after I defined it and got an error saying undefined method. So that was kind of frustrating. And I found that you could actually move it somewhere else and it would work, but then it was further away from the code and it, it, it really wasn't a great solution. Lambda, on the other hand, worked great. I, because you can define that anywhere you want. So here's a, a, a lambda, and uh, I called it here, and as you can see, it succeeded. We can use a lambda where a code block is expected by putting an ampersand in front of it. We can use a method where a lambda is expected by doing that. And, um, I'm gonna pass over this unless we have more time later. Lambdas and procs are selfless. I was surprised when I tried this. I tried outputting self inside a lambda and expected to see some 2S representation of the lambda. I didn't. Instead, you get the, um, the object in which it lives, in which it's enclosed. I was writing some code that modified class attributes, and private and public, and that kind of thing, and wanted to test that. And in the tests, I wanted to be able to set up and tear down classes before and after each test. And so I tried defining a class inside a method, and it didn't work. You can't do it. But with a lambda, you can do it. Uh, here we have um, a lambda that defines a class, and it gave no error, and when you instantiate that class, it works. So that's kind of an obscure thing, but um, that's helpful too. Transform chains. So we heard about predicates already. Transformers are things that change a value from one to another. When we think of iteration and enumeration, we usually think of taking data objects and passing them through something, doing something with them. But if we rotate that 90 degrees and instead Take a single data item and pass it through multiple transforms. So we're kind of switching the noun and the verb. Then um, we can create these little processing systems that can be very configurable. That too is a bit obscure, but um, it's an interesting use of, of, of lambdas. You can just have an array of undefined size of, of lambdas. 
And that's all the material I had. Uh, actually, I can go back to this. Um, comparing lambdas and procs, in Ruby, there's a class called proc. Lambdas are instances of procs. Um, but procs also include non-lambda procs, which is kind of confusing and a pain. But um, they do behave differently. So if you return from a lambda, um, it does not return from the method in which it lives, as you can see here. Whereas if you return from a proc, it does return from the method in which it lives. Another thing is um, lambdas are much more strict in their argument checking. They have, um, uh, well, we see here, we get an error if we give the wrong number of arguments to lambda, but not with a proc. And I just want to show you one other thing. Um, this is a, oh, here. So I have a gem called trick bag, and I've used some of these techniques in that. It's a Ruby gem that has just a bag of kind of unrelated utilities that I've found to be useful and wanted to put on the public internet somewhere so I could get them from anywhere. Um, and that's where this collection access thing is defined. This is what it looked like to define that lambda that we used to access that stuff. Although to be fair, it's calling this method, which is here. So it's a little bit more. But one of the things I love about Ruby is you can do a lot with a little bit of code. So I guess that's it. Um, any questions, comments? No? Okay, well thank you very much for your time.